and welcome to season four, episode 18 of the Sajam Photography Podcast. My name is Jason Teal, and I am back with an interview with none other than John Dunbar. Now, if you have anything to do with urban exploration in Korea, then you probably have heard his name. If not, if you are into, say, punk rock or things like that, you've probably heard his name. If you read any of the English newspapers, particularly with the Korea Times, you've probably seen his name. And with all of that, it makes for a really good interview because this is someone who I've wanted to touch base with for a while and kind of mysteriously it popped up with a with an odd story because he messaged me a number of months ago way back in February asking if I knew about Tongdo Fantasia and if I'd heard anything about a tiger. Well, you know, you don't get too many messages like that and it piqued my interest so we went out and explored the rundown amusement park and we found a very alive tiger in one of the enclosures just left off to its own bidding and so that sort of sparked a little bit of uh, interest and some very very interesting photos but also it really made me want to get John on here just to sort of talk about his his very very interesting life and he's one of those people where you know, you have a similar background. I think you'll you'll hear us talk about it in the interview. But, you know, we both grew up in Canada, kind of in the prairie areas, but we both have our backgrounds in punk rock and stuff like that. And we both have been in Korea for probably about the same time. So this is a kind of a very interesting issue because we both gravitated towards, you know, different areas of photography but we've sort of met through that and yeah, we ended up having an adventure where we helped out a tiger in, in part, you know, so very, very interesting stuff. At any rate, I'll leave you to the, the interview and have fun and let me know what you think. All right. Welcome to the show, John. Um, before we get ahead of ourselves here, I'll just let you uh, introduce yourself and uh, let everyone know who you are. Okay. Well, my name is John, and I'm originally from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I think two provinces o away from you. I came to Korea in 1996 for the first time as a high school student, and then I came back in late 2003 and have been here basically ever since. Right after I arrived, I got into the local punk scene in Hongdae and uh, have, still, have been a part of that the whole time, even though I'm in my 40s now. Uh, most of us are, actually. <laughs> Um, I run the website dehanmindecline.com, and I think it might actually be one of the oldest remaining like w blog kind of websites uh, about Korea in English currently, although my archives aren't fully online. Uh, I am also the general editor of transactions at the Royal Asiatic Society Korea and a copy editor at the Korea Times. Okay, <laughs> hopefully that covers it. I, I, I think it does. I think it does. And there's there's a lot that we can uh, jump into there. But uh, I, I do want to get into sort of your realm of like photographic expertise, because I think that's how we sort of uh, cross mm -hmm. paths and sort of the, uh, yeah, the, the Urban X kind of stuff and uh, different channels, I think. So can you, yeah. can you tell me a little bit more about your uh, photography? Well, I actually, in a lot of ways, don't consider myself a photographer. I'm more of a storyteller, I think, and just a camera is a really good device for doing that. Like, I tend to try to just take a lot of pictures, and then that way I can kind of narrate what happened after, rather than focus on, like, getting really, really good images. Uh, yeah. So uh, I actually originally started in photography because I was a news editor at the university newspaper back in Alberta. And uh, we had a lot of miscommunication with the photo staff, so I just th thought... I'll buy a camera and I'll join them. And that kind of worked. And I found out that I kind of had a bit of a talent for photography. Digital, not analog. I, I have a black thumb when it comes to film. Oh. Uh, so <laughs> like I have to not be dealing with film. <laughs> That's basically how my photographic style started and developed down the, the path that I've taken. Now, you uh, when you came to Korea, I know for myself, I, I was trained... In, in, in Canada, I did a number of courses, but it really took off when I came here, especially in those initial days where you're sort of trying to figure out life in Korea and then documenting it along the way. Is 
how did things kind of take off for you right. here in Korea? Well, yeah, definitely uh, being in such a radically different environment was uh, a very useful thing for me to, you know, put my ph photographic skills to use. Mm -hmm. uh, also, so like I would wander around and I would take pictures of things that caught my eye. Eventually that uh, led me to urban exploration. It also mm -hmm. immediately early on uh, led me into the music scene. Like back home in Canada, I had been going to concerts all the time, photographing them, putting pictures online and stuff like that for people to have. Back when it was very rare for people to do that uh, at shows. So I really just kept doing the same thing when I was in Korea. And so I kind of developed doing live music photography and, you know, urban cityscape kind of stuff simultaneously. And I think that's quite the eclectic mix, I think, uh, to be honest. Um how how were the photography uh going to a lot of shows in Canada especially the punk shows like um one of my biggest regrets yeah. is not documenting that but in the same sense I was I you know I know the guys that I hung out with and it would be end up a lot of broken equipment uh, <laughs> but um mm -hmm. how was the photography perceived here in the punk scene um like was it is was it a welcome addition or was it sort of like, hey, you know, this is my side gig. I don't want to be seen, uh, you know, rocking out before I go to the back to the office. <laughs> That's a very, very good and complicated question. When which I, I was just looking at earlier today, uh, I interviewed the lead singer of a band called the Lone Wolf Elegy Club. He's also uh, the lead singer of a band called Cockrasher. And uh, actually, it was maybe. 2007 or 8, I was photographing them at a show, and the lead singer tried his hardest to, while he was on stage, to swat the camera out of my hand. Oh, wow. Um, didn't succeed. I had it on a strap. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah. I, was, I, I was waiting for him outside when the, the show ended. I was, I was worried, because, you know, I know you don't fight Koreans, you know, no. when you're in Korea as a foreigner, because bad things will happen to you. Fortunately, mm -hmm. he came out and apologized immediately. But I asked oh, him about cool. that in this interview I just did he, like, I just translated it. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're talking late, actually. Oh, and um, he said, you know, he, he was kind of like, yeah, I'm sorry about that. But I stand by my decision to do that. <laughs> and basically, the way he saw it was um, I was taking embarrassing photos of, of people, you know. And oh. in, in his uh, opinion, you know, I, I had quite a lot of these and a lot of Korean musicians. Keep in mind, we're talking about punks. Uh, yeah. We're being uncomfortable when they were performing and I was photographing them. They were afraid, like... So this guy in particular, I got a shot of him with his eyes rolled back in his head. Uh, and I commented online, it looked like he was a zombie or something like that. Oh, and that man. upset him, yeah. And I'm, I'm like, you know, to me, uh, punk is, you know, goofy faces. Yeah, I think that's a large part of it. But to Koreans, any Koreans, including punks, that's a, they have a much more complicated attitude towards... Uh, um, you know, my uh, towards being photographed in, in a way that they don't necessarily approve of. And to be totally honest, I, uh, you know, I take tons of pictures when I photograph a band and I choose the pictures to upload that uh, entertain me the most. Mm -hmm. I try to get pictures that look good and professional, but I try to, if I find one that's hilarious, I will also put that online, of course, you know. It's uh, a complicated issue. Uh, and, and this guy, actually, he even told me that if this were happening more around today, then it is possible, like, some people might even try to sue me for getting, you know, silly pictures of them. I don't know. It's Korea. I don't know how how possible that is. I could see it being possible. But uh, it is pretty ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, it, it, when it, when you mentioned about that, uh, it just sort of popped into my head. Because, as I said, like, I've, like, my history going back to the, uh, the, punk scene in the prairies and whatnot uh, yeah like mm -hmm. i mean as you said it's, it's it's all silly faces it's it's uh you're there putting on a show but yeah. being here in korea and i i don't have honestly i'll I'd fully admit i haven't really uh jumped into the punk scene in uh korea mostly because there's like zero punk scene in ulsan <laughs> here so it's it's uh you know outside of the local expat crew uh doing a cover songs of creed I, I don't think there's much of a uh, <laughs> music scene yeah. but um you know i i can imagine that image trumps a lot oh. of the um punk passion as i would call it 
So yeah, I yeah. think um, having these uh, quote unquote embarrassing photos might uh, yeah might cause some issues. <laughs> that being said, like going outside of the band, because like as I said, like one of the things I regret is not uh, photographing a lot of like the punk scene back in the prairies. Cause I think that was a, uh, a once in a lifetime sort of moment. I don't think the, you'll really mm-hmm. get that. Um, but here I, I know it's, I'm going to use probably an overused term called counterculture, but I mean, uh, when you think of Korea, you think of K-pop and, um, all well, of that. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, the word punk, like, I mean, as, as we talked about, uh, in many conversations before Japan, yeah, you kind of have that, um, uh, kind of idea of the, uh, the, the kind of the, uh, rockabilly punk scene there, but you don't really catch a whiff of it here unless you know where to go. Uh, yeah, there's like two bands that do that maybe. Yeah. So how, how is, uh, how is, how are the fans and how is the scene? Like, is it, um, uh, like when you're documenting that, is, is there much of a pushback towards the photos or is there well, people like- generally? Yeah. Um, there are issues, but I mean, it's just like back home. Everybody knows each other. It's mm. it's a community. I, I went from going to shows in Edmonton to, you know, two weeks past and suddenly I'm going to shows in Seoul. And uh, from what I could tell, there are more similarities than differences, really. Oh. Um, and a lot of the, the differences were better. Like, you know, they had hardcore and punk at one show, which we didn't have in Edmonton at the time. Um, so yeah, I, I would have to say that just like anywhere else, really, I mean, when I was in my early days here, I, I noticed that there were a lot of foreigners coming here and being kind of having bad attitudes like, oh yeah, I hate Korea. I don't like being here. But the mm. foreigners who came here and were involved in the punk scene were well adjusted, integrated, had tons of Korean friends and, you know, thought differently. Um, oh, wow. our, our Korean friends certainly say bad things about Korean all the time and about Korea all the time and sing songs about how they hate Korea, but you know, we don't. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of somewhat changed now. Like there are a lot more well-integrated foreigners, you know, it's normal, you know, to, to to say like, I've only been here five years these days, you know, it used to be like, I've been here two years and everybody's like, wow, you've been here forever. Exactly. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) It's good to have the, the memories from early on and remember that what, what that was like. Like, there was virtually nobody else documenting this sort of thing, uh, you know, until digital cameras became really widespread. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I'm actually planning to start a, a collection soon, like a, probably an Instagram channel, showing my pictures from pre-2004 of the Edmonton punk scene, just to oh, be nice. like, you know, capture that era. Uh, I learned the hard way that, not necessarily through first-hand experience, but uh, in the Korean punk scene, and probably in any music scene or community that you've been part of for a long time, mm-hmm. it's not a great idea to share really old pictures. Be- the, one, like one friend of mine actually published a book of her photos. Uh, she didn't uh, put these pictures online very much until, mm-hmm. and then suddenly one day she published a book, like of pictures taken 15 years earlier from the book's publication, and people were getting upset because you know it would show people before plastic surgery, it would show people with previous partners. And maybe, I don't know if, if they saw the embarrassing shots in there too. I'm not sure. Her style <laughs> might not have been quite like that. But yeah, so uh, I, I actually, uh, around 2010, I cut off all my uh, archives to, to my website. Yeah, I, I disabled it for a while. And then my archive only goes back to 2011. It restarted now. Uh, and largely that's just because, you know, I don't want to uh, see pictures of exes and things like that. And I yeah. don't want to upset people and stuff. So I occasionally resurrect old photos, but I do it very carefully. Yeah, well, and I think that's something that's like I, I, I've i seen. I don't know. There's a very famous uh, punk project. Um, they got an England somewhere where someone went back and they like re the old like uh-huh. classic. Uh, and I think in those cases, there's there's a general acceptance. But I think, yeah, like it's it'll be like even looking back to where my punk friends are like, you know, some of us, it, it's fine. It's, it's a great image, but I know some who have moved on to say um, legal positions or higher up positions might not want to have uh, those pictures of themselves in, um, uh, you know, different circumstances, uh, you know, showing up 
but you know, I, I think for myself, like it, it's, uh, you know, especially now, um, you know, if you've been following like, uh, the, the, uh, fat Mike and stuff like that, where they've opened up the punk museum in Las Vegas and, uh, Oh yeah. I sent some books there. Yeah. So, you know, like, I think there's going to be more of this kind of stuff, uh, popping up, well, especially in, in North America, but like, I mean, definitely i would love to see the punk scene in korea be be more documented at least um yeah. and maybe it's, uh, something that might not go over too well here but uh it'd certainly be interesting and a good read if it ever became a book the way i see it i'll hopefully have a couple of decades to work on that you know maybe awesome. old older pictures will be appreciated more when you know the people in them are elderly <laughs> yeah <You know>? yeah <laughs> Now, actually, speaking about publications, I I was uh, had a chance to uh, read through some of your publications. Oh yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about your zines and and sort of how that all came about. Because I mean, like, um, you don't see too much of that these days. It's all online yeah. or on Instagram. So, what what's the message behind that, and what's the process? Well, actually, uh, the zine started in early two thousand five. Uh, and even then it seemed like kind of, you know, something out of time that you just didn't see anymore. In fact, I think that zines are probably more popular now than they were almost 20 years ago. Um, (laughs) I think they're kind of a retro thing now that a lot of people make and really not punk zines anymore. But yeah, I'd always wanted to do something like that to just give myself a platform where I could, or give other people also, um, you know, a chance to, um, talk about the scene that I like and uh other things that crossed my mind did i only give you i think i gave you best of broken korea number three yeah i think um yeah, yeah that's volume three there and yeah i think that's it's, yeah i think that was the one that you gave me yeah okay only that one uh yeah so i printed that one last year before i went back to my hometown because mm-hmm. i thought rather than distributing one of the normal zines uh, it would be better to have something like that. And a lot of the articles in there are interviews with people who are also observing the scene, like uh, maybe a guy who uh, was doing a documentary or something like that. Uh, there's a yeah. few things like that there. So it's it's not interviews with the bands necessarily, uh, but interviews with people, uh, you know, talking about the scene so that mm. uh, an unfamiliar reader could maybe understand a bit more about, you know, what it's actually like. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it was definitely like a very interesting read. And, and you know, and again, like it sort of took me back to to again, like where, uh, as I said before, like we did a um, not really a zine, but like a newspaper back in the beginning of my time right. here in Ulsan. Uh, but this harkened back to like even before that, like high school era for me, like making this stuff and printing it out or you know, getting, getting a zine at a show or something like that, which yeah. like, I mean, I, I truly enjoyed. Um, and especially some of the, some of the content was, you know, it was definitely a good read and it basically for me as well, you know, the photography and the writing as well showed me a different side of Korea, one that I, I hadn't really explored too much because, you oh. know, like down here in Ulsan, you get your mix of, um, you know, I guess you'd say like uh, English teachers and some engineers and maybe some international students, but there's not really, dare I say, a scene of anything. It's just mostly oh. just, you know, occupations. And then uh, people will go up to uh, Seoul in sort of like an observer capacity. Um, yeah. And I think like the only person um, that I can really think of is... Um, is is Phil who who did like the uh the music scene and uh has has gone on to uh di- different projects but you know like my 20 years here you know one guy <laughs> so um yeah like so I, I think this was a really good introduction to it you're you're continuing on with this or are you are there more issues in in the in the pipe or anything like that yeah i'm working on issue 32 right now it's timed so that it'll be released in about uh, a month when there's a uh, festival called It's a Fest that's being held uh, on an island just off Incheon Airport. Uh, it's like oh. a three-day beach punk festival organized by uh, some friends of mine who run a label oh, called wow. World Domination Incorporated. So my plan awesome. is, like, 
they had one before in 2019. And uh, I remember doing that one. It was, you know, it was a long time and I, I needed to spend time just unwinding and stuff. And I actually had a, a copy of a, a friend of mine's book that he was pitching around mm -hmm. uh, called something like This Rancid Mill by Kyle Decker. It's like a, a, a punk uh, detective novel set in the early 80s in L.A. Oh, so wow. I was reading this thing at the, the beach, basically. I remember I was sitting in a chair next to the stage reading it. And like somebody looked over and commented on me like, what are you, what are you doing? You're at a punk festival. Why are you reading? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to normalize reading at shows. So yeah, my plan actually is to like try to set up a little library there so that people can go and get like, you know, zines or books or whatever, including uh, uh, the new zine and have something to uh, keep their mind, uh, you know, have some, something else to put their mind on when they don't necessarily want to be listening to music, you know, nonstop three days. Yeah. Or on the train back. <laughs> it's not a very profitable model. Just like, you know, I print out the thing and then I hand it out at shows for free. Uh, I think it's got to be free or otherwise I don't think people would take it. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's basically the, the strategy, you know. The way I see it, I'm not really competing with much. Like, I suppose a zine competes with your cell phone. But, you know, there are limitations to where you can read a zine or a newspaper or or look at your phone also. So uh, I'm hoping in the future that we go a little bit more off our phones and kind of go back and appreciate print material, print, uh, you know, writing more too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think like for myself, like even, uh, you know, from a photographic uh, perspective, but also like from someone who's actually like done the, the whole print scene, like, uh, you know, you hear photographers waxing poetic about like seeing their photos in print, but I, mm. I, I think like it, it is sort of a, a creation of sorts. Like you don't get that same feeling uh, when it's on your phone as where, yeah. where you have like, you know, you can feel this and with a zine, like it, you know, it's, it's not polished. It, it it's, it's very yeah. rough and, and it's very creative and it it's for me, it, it's, it's something very unique. So it, it's, you know, if you're at a show, it, it's something that you can take away from that. So I think that's a really yeah. cool idea. No, All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i i do love the i i do love the like punk library thing like i think that's when you're at a show like that that's just something unique uh, as opposed to just uh you know uh being yeah. merch kind of thing so I, I like the idea about how wrong it initially sounds <laughs> exactly yeah but i mean you know i i'm as we talked about before like i'm i'm from that era where like I, I i liked a little bit of intellectualism in, in my punk like mixed in like and and i think like that was sort of the um you know being able to read is is a good component of that <laughs> you know uh, yeah um, i think so yeah but all right kind of abruptly switching topics uh you and i had uh finally met up uh a few months ago in a yep. um daring adventure into the uh the cool. mountains around Ulsan to, to track down a tiger. <laughs> um, <Yep. laughs> I, I do want to touch on that because it, you know, it became a, um, a news piece. I, I was interviewed. I had some um, photos from that time published, um, but I'm not going to say that it was, uh, I had anything uh, to do with the discovery. I'll, I'll let you sort of jump into that and um, just sort of, Tell me about how you found out about a tiger uh, being stored in a uh, abandoned amusement park. Well, I certainly didn't find it by myself. Uh, there was a, a guy who uh, put together kind of a hasty uh, YouTube channel. In fact, we should check on that. I don't know if he's still updating it. Um, uh, and the only video was like, you know, we went to this abandoned amusement park in Ulsan and you won't believe what we found in the middle of it. And when a friend first posted that link to me, I, I was like, oh, I hate these clickbait titles. And then I looked at it. I, I flipped through it. I was like, why did she post this? And then I saw immediately, oh, there's a tiger there. Yep. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I knew I had to go there and see for myself what the hell was going on. And even when you when you met me, um, it was something like I, I, I wasn't even like sure. Like I was like, OK, like this is the era of you know, clickbait titles and, you know, yeah. 
wait till the end and you wait till the end and like nothing happens. Yeah. But seeing that tiger, I was like, there's no <laughs> way, like there's no way it, it's, it's going to be there. So like when, when you came down, I was sort of like half expecting some sort of resistance. Um, yeah. Cause you know, like I, I've been through these places before, like, you know, sometimes you can squeak in, but most of the time, you, you know, there's going to be a, someone there, you know, Oh. And I was fully expecting massive disappointment when you when you came down, but oh. um, it was it was a really surreal experience, and and I do have to yeah. thank you for for dragging me along with this because I have to thank you for driving me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the the takeaway from this is like, I mean, you and I have been here for a number of years, and. Um, the attraction of like these abandoned amusement parks is one thing, but having a live tiger just sort of stuck in there, that, that was another thing. Yeah. When, I, I've never imagined anything like that would be, you know, we could uh, find that. I, I want to kind of touch on like, before we get too um, into like, sort of like, I do want to talk about like the, the surroundings as well, but you know, you, you printed the story it, and it got mm -hmm. uh, some coverage. People were contacted I know that the tiger was transferred to to another zoo, but can you can yep. you fill us in on what what exactly happened with all this situation? Yeah. So uh, as soon as I got back to work uh, after meeting you, I think it was even the Sunday. I, I talked with one of our reporters uh, who contacted the company, managed to interview somebody who was in charge of that situation, mm -hmm. um, and according to them, actually they had reached a deal last summer with Uchi Zoo Park in Guangzhou. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's the same zoo that took in Moon Jae-in's dogs that he gave up. Mm -hmm. So two, uh, you know, a a sets of animals, let's say from uh, the city of uh, Yangsan end up at yep. the same zoo. Um, so apparently the, the transfer had just been delayed because the receiving zoo had to like, build a facility for the tiger and also at some point it just got too cold and apparently they need warmer weather when they move tigers or something i guess it's like an open you know it's it's not like a you know a, a truck with an indoor that's heated or anything like that uh, okay, so the tiger yeah. would probably i guess have cold air blowing on it or something but yeah so apparently um i never really got a sense of what the company that owned the the abandoned park was thinking it was uh owned like for not too many years by a uh construction company i hadn't heard of mm -hmm. and it seems like they just kind of got it they probably wanted to redevelop the land or something i don't know and then they found out they were stuck with a tiger and they actually had somebody living in that uh abandoned nearly abandoned hotel next to the site who apparently would go to feed the tiger every day so the tiger okay. wasn't exactly left alone you know she looked well fed the mm -hmm. one thing that really shocked me, and I don't really know the total facts about this, uh, my reporter asked the guy, like, you know, can you confirm any details about the tiger? Like, is the tiger really named Hosuni? How old mm -hmm. is she? You know, uh, how heavy is she? Because she's a fairly big tiger. He yeah. didn't know anything like that. Like, he, he seemed <laughs> to indicate that the person who knew all those details had left the company. Um, oh. and so maybe they had a file with that somewhere and he just didn't have it in front of him at that moment, or they just lost all the details. So actually the week after I met you, I went to Guangzhou also, there just so happened mm -hmm. to be a punk show that night in the city. So I, you know, planned to go there and visit the zoo. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, we wandered around, couldn't find where they could put another tiger, but yeah, not on public display. Saw one of Moon Jae In's dogs. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, shortly after that. I, I talked with my friends who work at Guangzhou News over there, and they were very interested in writing a, an article about the situation uh, and framing it as kind of like this Guangzhou Zoo comes to the rescue, kind of. They're a very kind of pro-Guangzhou, obviously, uh, you know, publication. And they love having stories where they can put it that way. Uh, exactly, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, they certainly made the situation sound good anyway, that the tiger's getting the care that she needs and all that. They published a picture or two of the tiger there. I think uh, so, but yeah. they also didn't ever confirm what the tiger's name is. <laughs> so I don't know the story behind that. I really want to know, is is she named Hosuni or is that a mix-up? And 
this is wrong. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's tough to say, like, and kind of hearing how the uh, construction company, I'm pretty sure, um, you know, in, in my mind, the way way the pieces are falling, I, I'm pretty sure that they, you know, if they, if they purchased Tongdo Fantasia, and, you know, it was maybe one of those things where once everything was signed, sealed, and dojongs were stamped, they're like, oh, by the way, um, yeah. there's a tiger out there. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's just mind boggling. Like, you know, my first impressions of, <laughs> of walking up this, this place is empty. You know, it, it's, it's decaying, falling apart. And mm -hmm. then you hear those kind of like mournful howls. Uh, that you yeah. can also hear, I think, in the um, in the in the YouTube video, and and yeah, yeah, there there's a live tiger just cruising around. She's been transferred, right? I think that's yeah. She's, she's, in she's left. Yeah. she's in Guangzhou yeah. now. She's not on public display, but uh, is getting whatever care she needs before doing that. And to be Perfect. honest, this was something that I've been wondering about. Like, you know, we were so concerned. Everybody was so concerned about this poor tiger left alone here, but you know. Like the alternative is like, are tigers made to be put on display? You know, like, will it fulfill her existence if she can be seen by school kids? I'm not sure. Like, I almost wonder if she didn't have a good thing going there. <laughs> well, yeah, because I mean, I don't have a big love affair with with like zoos and especially not the ones I've seen around here. And and that sort of concerns me as well. Like, you know, like when we were there, she seemed to be aware of our presence. How is she going to react with, yeah, like hundreds of kids like beating on the glass? Like, you know. Well, um, that's that's one good thing. The, the, the facilities at the other zoo, there's two types. There's the kind where it's like, there's not glass, but like a big uh, trough, you know, that the tiger can't oh, okay. jump, jump over. So, the, you know, that means... You know, there wouldn't be some kids tapping on the glass. There's another uh, type uh, also where, you know, there is kind of a glass enclosure so you can, like, walk and, like, kind of look from pretty close uh, down on the tigers. Mm -hmm. um, and the tigers that were in there that we saw, uh, they have quite a lot of tigers there, at least five. Um, wow. You know, they were just sleeping the whole time, you know, and didn't seem too concerned by humans. Okay. So it did look like it could be a better facility anyway. Yeah, I'm hopeful. <laughs> kind of getting into the the Tongdo Fantasia thing because, like, one one of the things, and and we'll sort of cross into the Urban X thing, but um, yeah. I was I was I was very reluctant to uh, share many of the photos of Tongdo Fantasia outside of sort of the the Urban X realm, mm -hmm. just because of. Why. And and I've seen this happen to like not only rooftoping but like other areas where and especially now you've got the Instagram kind of crew. But it it was what? like sharing a photo. Oh, hey, that's cool. I want to do the the rundown Disney model thing. And next thing you know, oh. you've got like hundreds of people uh, filing in out there. What are you? What are your thoughts? Because like I mean, like I I generally like our adventure out there was for lack of a better term, fucking awesome. Like, I mean, it was, yeah. you know, blew my mind, but it, I was really reluctant because not that I want to keep it for myself, but I just didn't yeah. want people to go traipsing through there who didn't really understand the get in, get out without anyone noticing kind of vibe. Yeah. And the whole, you know, don't break stuff and all that. Yeah. Um, that's a concern. Uh, we were in, Uncharted territory there because of the situation with the tiger. Yeah, like you couldn't really tell that story without mentioning abandoned amusement park. Yeah, so it was it was exceptional conditions. You know, I heard a story one time about somebody who found a litter of kittens in an abandoned building somewhere in the states, and they were like, I think they they smashed a wall to rescue the kittens or something. Normally, urban explorers shouldn't do that, but in that mm -hmm. situation, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I honestly didn't think about it as much it was you know still there it's all automatic you know what i do mm -hmm. about privacy of sites but i never really thought we got to keep this a secret from people uh yeah. the good things about that site is you know there is still a fence you had to jump over that'll deter yeah, yeah. a lot of people 
it's not too easy to get to. I, I can't yeah. imagine people traveling very far across the country to go there, especially mm -hmm. in Seoul. You, you could just go to Yongma land instead. No problem. So, uh, yeah, that's a concern. I have seen sites blow up. Where, not literally blow up, but, you know, where they uh, get too much uh, attention. Um, there was the uh, abandoned mental hospital in Gonjiam near Seoul. Uh, okay. It was getting to the point where they're having like dozens of visitors per day. Uh, oh, wow. And then shortly after that, CNN reported it was one of the most haunted places in Korea. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that probably would have increased it. And then there was a movie filmed called Gonjiam, which was like a kind of pseudo found footage documentary kind of thing. And that was not filmed on location. It was filmed about the location, but uh, the property owners, I'm assuming, didn't want them there. And shortly after the movie was uh, released, uh, the actual hospital was demolished. And I've seen that before. There was uh, Jumbo 747. It was uh, the second ever constructed 747 was, after it retired, it was um, reopened as a restaurant in Namyangju, just north of Seoul. Mm -hmm. And on my visit, I made the mistake of taking a guy there who writes for Vice. And oh. it got into Vice. And we started getting like a lot of visitors from overseas going there. And a lot okay. of them were putting it in big magazines and also and everything. And at some point, the owners of the property, they ha still had a restaurant that was active next door. They just mm -hmm. like kind of felt shameful. So they demolished the thing. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. So like... That's kind of the ultimate fate of sites that get ruined like that. That or, you know, a door gets locked or something like that. Uh, so, like, a very important part of urban exploring is, you know, sustainability of the sites. Yeah. You know, uh, like, it's great to be the first one to visit a site. By the way, we weren't the first no. uh, at Tongdo Fantasia. <laughs> but it's a terrible thing to be the last, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like if you if you go somewhere and just ruin a site, you know, let's say you make a video online and let's say site security sees so they lock all the doors, then, yeah. you know, you just ruined it. <laughs> uh, or you, you know, one guy I, I knew actually went to the mental hospital and he tried, you know, that thing where you take steel wool and you light it on fire and you swirl it around and you make those kind of yeah like yeah the weird spirals rings. yeah and then bl burn everything down yeah <laughs> yeah i do that in uh in like you know concrete tunnels but he was yeah. going to do it in the in the actual uh hospital like in the actual um hallway with drywall oh. the only reason he didn't burn it down was because he bought those steel wool colored um uh dishwashing uh sponges rather than actual steel wool oh wow <laughs> yeah um Jesus. Yeah, that was the wake up call to me that, you know, I, I realized we got to be more careful with locations. Well, yeah, like like that's what like kind of I want to talk touch on, because like, you know, it, if you go back far enough back into my archives of, of rooftoping and, and I was fairly open and I will honestly admit I was I was a little bit naive, too. And one of the we things that, then, because we didn't we didn't yeah. know any uh, there, there was no precedent for this in Korea. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I, I wrote a bunch of articles about, you know, like which places I go to. And I, I still remember um, one of the rooftops I went to. It, it was a beautiful rooftop, but um, I got to the top fairly easily using my normal methods. And oh. I, I remember going to the one corner where I got most of my shots from. And now keep in mind that this is a corner of a rooftop in behind some bushes like you know there's those weird planters that they put on the tr on the rooftops and i look over mm -hmm. my shoulder and there's a security camera right there like there's no mm -hmm. reason to have a cctv pointed at the bushes in the corner outside mm -hmm. of you know photographers going up there and i look around and you know there's like some beer cans scattered in those bushes and oh, yeah. i i wouldn't say it was because of me but i would say in part because of maybe the photos I've published or the photos that other people have published, many people would go there and it was going from just get in, get out, don't let anyone see you to like, um, as I think we talked about before, another one, another rooftop I went to, there were a bunch of foreigners having a picnic on the helipad. It's stuff like that where it, it's very easy to sort of uh, ruin a site because people I don't think really understand that. 
you know, by and large, you're not really supposed to be there. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, kind of going back to the the um, Tongville Fantasia, which mm-hmm. you know, like I I would love to to get back and explore a little bit more. Um, you should. Yeah, I, I want to know how I'm, it is now. <laughs> I, I I do want to peek around. I think once maybe once the weather gets a little bit better. But yeah. what were your first impressions? Because like I mean, I stumbled across my old musings uh, way back in probably two thousand four. Or 2003 maybe uh, yeah. my first like hogwan uh field trip out there so that's that's all oh, yeah. that's probably like the last time i'd been out there before we were there but what were mm. your first impressions of this place like because it was, it was kind of really cool i think yeah i've been to i think that one made about 16 abandoned amusement parks in korea i i kind of feel like i know what to expect of them like if i see a really weird ride i i know what kind of general ride it is you know like oh yeah like this if you go around to the side you'll see that or something Mm -hmm. so like i felt pretty much like prepared for it Mm -hmm. um going to these kinds of sites doesn't really fill me with like you know tension or excitement as much as it used to you know uh to me it's just you know i know what to expect and um but i do have to say that was within the top three for sure Mm -hmm. And it was by far the largest abandoned amusement park I've ever seen. Um, yeah. yeah, like many of the other ones were so much smaller than that. Probably you could have fit about 10 other abandoned amusement parks in that one. It was it was just so large. And the others are usually so small. Uh, yeah, exactly. So yeah, Tongdo Fantasia was huge. Yeah, um, yeah. The rides were generally in much better shape than uh, than you can find, you know. Like um, probably a lot of them could still operate. Yeah. If they had electricity, I'm not sure I'd ride them. I actually don't like going on amusement park rides. The one thing that really impressed me the most actually were were the, well, I guess two things, the the two kind of haunted house things, you know, the one with, where it's a spaceship and the other one, which was, I think, Dracula's castle. Yeah. And yeah. they left those like kind of di- like life-size dioramas inside. Probably they looked like they were supposed to originally move around. But yeah. by then, like, you know, the, like the materials were just kind of like melting off basically and it looked more <laughs> gruesome and gory as far as like an experience of going to an amusement park and photographing something cool that was really cool yeah so uh yeah you know it was pretty nice uh getting in uh was pretty easy i had been worried because we saw so many people walking around outside but it's just because pedestrians walk by and kind of they don't want to walk all the way around on the sidewalk they want to kind of take shortcuts you know, yeah. shave off a few seconds. They seemed well, pretty casual about that park. I, I think it's like, especially out there, and, and this is going kind of going back to like what I call like sort of the etiquette is that a, a, as long as you're not making a huge kerfuffle, um, yeah. you know, like no, especially out there, like nobody really cares. <laughs> if you just are there, you take some photos and you leave, you know, even the security is just going to be like, hmm, okay, whatever. And but once you once you come with like a big pack of people, then they're gonna be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Took them oh, yeah. yeah like what, what what are you doing here? Yeah. And out there, especially like because everyone's walking past, it's not it kind of works in the favor because yeah. nobody really says like, okay, well, what are what are these guys doing here? Oh, just walking past, you know, decide to yeah, wander we, through. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we we're certainly taking certain actions to reduce the risk also you know like yeah. uh there's all sorts of things like we certainly didn't climb any fences in view of anybody ever yeah um yeah so i, I like we still took precautions i think if like somebody were walking towards us and they saw us go over the fence and it was on like in the direction they were headed they might shout something who knows yeah uh, some people um not everybody but yeah everybody's different and uh there are certain ways to reduce those risks. Yeah, well, I think that's that that's sort of the key that like like when like I I, I posted a few shots in uh, the local like Busan Light Stalkers, but I said you know like mm-hmm. I remember putting in the description like I said I'm not, you know like everybody knows where this is. I'm not gonna you know be full out and tell everybody where it is. And I remember getting some flack for that. Like one guy was like, yeah. well, "Why won't you just tell us where it is?" I was like, "Well, like." 
everybody knows where it is. So I'm going to just leave it to you to go out there on your own volition. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to roll out a red carpet for you just because, yeah. you know, like people that, you know, and, and, and it's nothing like nothing wrong, but like, I mean, some people just don't have that sort of foresight where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to jump this fence while, you know, these three harmonies are, are walking towards me. Like they just, you yeah. know, some people just don't really click in and it's not about sneaking around. It's just, you know, not opening up that can of worms, you know, or not doing that action in front of people where they can say something or call somebody or something like that, you know, like, yeah, like you're right. You know, there's enough information out there that anybody could figure it out, which one it is, especially after the articles came out. But exactly. uh, yeah. yeah, part of not making it super easy also is like, let's say that you publicly labeled those photos, Tongdo Fantasia, then yeah. you really have no way of knowing who's getting that information. And maybe one person looks at that, that you didn't know about, and they go there and make their own video and maybe they smash something and maybe yeah. they uh, um, post directions on how to get there for everybody. It's really important to you know, main some, maintain some sort of control on this, you know, like uh, how many people know, how many people are going, things like that. Yeah. Um, I think that's the reason that urban exploring hasn't, uh, well, hasn't caught on in popularity in Korea, but also hasn't caused problems with, you know, local law, you know. Um, so, yeah, to be honest, it's a good situation to be like that. And, you know, other parts of the world, uh, it's been ruined, like, you mentioned you've lost a few roofs. Hong Kong, you know, uh, about a decade ago was one of the greatest destinations for rooftops. Now they have virtually nothing left because everything's been locked up because every roof has been hit by, you know, YouTube influencers and stuff like that. It's good to be a little low key. <laughs> yeah, I think with with the the location thing, uh, I, I think one of the biggest issues I see is is basically like again like giving out that open invitation. I I know I've seen uh, was a Gaia Land was um, you know overrun with people, and yeah, you know, when you mentioned about like uh, people traveling, that that was the biggest thing. Like people were going out there, they were getting cars and going out and visiting this place, which. Uh, they actually had guard dogs for a while. I think I mentioned I got bit in the yep. ass by one. I brought dog treats and I have a picture of myself posing with that dog. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> different visits for listeners. You know, and and I think like I, I think like the biggest problem I had with that was that there's people who just didn't didn't really understand what they were doing. So I remember hearing people getting in uh, to arguments with the. Uh, there was, I think at some point there was some caretakers or something like that that would roam around the site. And generally they were okay with people. If you visited certain hours of the day, they didn't really give a shit. But uh, after a while, yeah, they were really kind of annoyed, especially I think when I went into like the, uh, they're trying to transition into, I forget they reopened it now or something like they that. They did. But yeah. Yeah. I actually published so, an article about that, about it reopening. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you you probably know more about this than I do, but yeah, I think like there, there were a lot of people who just went there for the attraction of the abandoned amusement park and didn't really give two shits about what yeah. they were traipsing on, I guess. There was, there was actually a guy who visited a couple years earlier than it opened. He He went all the way down there, explored it, you know, did the usual thing. And then like waited a year or two, I think about two years before he started like talking about this, I guess probably after he got done his travels and got around to catching up with his photo archives or something. And, uh, and then suddenly there was like a wave of kind of clickbait articles like, Oh, this European guy, you know, goes all the way to Korea and goes all the way to this amusement park. And he was disturbed at what he found. And it's like, he couldn't believe his <laughs> eyes. And it's like, no, he went there for that. Like this is a clickbait language. Um, yeah. And he was writing about like, oh, I can't believe this amusement park was closed. And, you know, we actually called the amusement park. They had reopened. And so I wrote an article being like, uh, the news of this being an abandoned amusement park is no longer valid. <laughs> yeah. So if you're going there, you're going to be paying for rides. Yeah. So uh, that was kind of a weird thing. I think it was also not that bad, though, like articles that could potentially have brought more attention to the site. You know, mm -hmm. at that point, it would have 
just maybe sent more customers to an active business. It might, it might have been a lot of people who were like, oh, I was going to take pictures of, you know, decaying rides, but they're yeah, not yeah. decaying now, you know, <laughs> which was well, pretty funny. That's why I, I had I to write an article. That, yeah, well, I, I certainly hope that they, they repaired the Ferris wheel, because I think when I was there, like one of the carriages had like dropped off. So that was kind of <laughs> freaky. Yeah. Um, but it, but I think like you know, kind of touching on like the Tongo Fantasia, like I'm kind of under the outside of the safety issue, outside mm-hmm. of the safety issue, you know, like decaying stuff, people climbing on, rusting things. You know, I think they might as well if they're not going to use it or if they're just going to bulldoze it, they might as well just like open it up and let people, mm-hmm. you know, um, because I, I I think like. Um, outside of sort of what I call like the Western philosophy of like locking everything up and, you know, yep. having security, you know, paying people to keep people away from a site that they're not using, which I find kind of strange. Oh. Yeah. Like it, it, it's like, it's just gonna, if you're just going to let it sit there, you might as well let people kind of wander around and have it. Yeah. Well, have you heard of, uh, of Yongma land in Seoul? I, I have. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. It's basically, it was an abandoned amusement park, but the guy realized people were coming to visit, so he just like set up a door charge, <laughs> and you can go there do the same thing, and you know, you just got to pay the guy to get in. That's it. I think, I think, I think that's probably the smart deal. decision. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been there since before the pandemic, but I remember it used to get like pretty large groups of people. You know, <laughs> well, didn't they like film some sort of K-pop music video there, and that then that just yeah. just exploded because people crayon pop to, like... bar bar bar, yeah. Yes. The closest I've ever yeah. liked to K-pop. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, it's uh, it's tragic that uh, they had the, the the song is pretty catchy, but uh, it's more yeah. of a wonder, I guess. <laughs> it was uh, pretty amusing that they were wearing helmets. You don't see K-pop groups doing that anymore. <laughs> it, it, I think, kind of reminiscing about that, like it, that song came out of nowhere, and it was like one of these like instant hits and i remember like seeing like yeah. local government officials like you know doing the the jumping dance and stuff like that and it was just like but you know maybe they're a victim of their own success but uh yeah certainly haven't yeah, seen any anything like that since then <laughs> yeah i think after that k-pop kind of became a lot more about hip-hop and about like yeah. looking tough uh, even though not being tough <laughs> yeah <laughs> looking so, tough in a designer suit yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> actually well, Craven pop uh played at a, a festival in hongdae once uh wow. they basically they shared the stage with a heavy metal band um and apparently the the metal band were playing live and the the k-pop part was just like pre-recorded you know and they were oh. basically dancing to pre-recorded music to the backing yeah. of a metal band <laughs> but yeah pretty weird thing <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's kind of uh, re- reminiscent, maybe of, of um, baby metal or something like that. But uh, yeah, that might have been what they were going for. If that, I don't know which one came first. But yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I I will say if if there is ever like a heavy metal K pop like with that kind of vibe, I I, I would go for it. Hmm. Like, I I just want to see something with a little bit more edge than you know new jeans or whatever's on the the current yeah. trend. That's kind of the problem, though. Like the K-pop industry is set up like they have made rock bands in the past. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the problem is they just keep doing the same thing. Like the only difference between a K-pop rock band and a K-pop group is, you know, one group holds instruments, you know? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, not a fan. (laughs) Like it's still, you know, run, you know, it's still the same industry. And really, it's the mm-hmm. industry that's the biggest problem with K-pop, you know, more than a yep. particular style of any particular band. So, yeah, it's the kind of thing that I want to stay far away from. <laughs> with the K-pop industry, from my understanding, is it like I'll call it like a meat grinder. Like it's, yeah. uh, you know, they, they have a product that they want to churn out. So basically, they're just stuffing as much as they can and cranking that wheel and producing yeah. whatever comes out. It's and, industrialized. Yeah. 100 percent like it's 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 your uh you know your fast food uh product uh and yeah the the only issue i have with it like i don't really like uh you know 
tend to grind on people's uh, musical tastes. I mean, I tried to do that last thing you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you run through my catalog, there will probably be some issues. But the the biggest thing Ooh. I have is that like you, you just have to admit it is what it is. Like it. Like I mean, yeah. I know that people would you know throw themselves on a sword for for BTS, and that's great. But you you have to admit. At some point, the same as if you're eating a Big Mac every day, you have to admit that this is not high end food. This is this is industrialized, mass produced food. And if you but what if it, what if you perfect. eat ten chicken McNuggets? That's the BTS and meal, and the, and the <laughs> special sauce, yeah, <laughs> yeah, which wasn't very special here. Cajun sauce, yeah, yeah, which they, I did like, admittedly. <laughs> oh yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it is. It is a fine sauce, but it's it was already available in Korea. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, are we to really expect that BTS selected that as their favorite meal? They were like, we like not nine, but ten chicken McNuggets. You know, it makes no sense. If it were me, I would have made it eight chicken McNuggets. I think that's the number of people in the band. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like one for each of them. Exactly. And just have different shapes, you know, like yeah. have dinosaur nuggets or something. They could have had that, but shape them like the individual guys' heads or something. <laughs> exactly yeah well yeah. I, you know and I, and I think that was probably sort of like um mcdonald's trying to monopolize on the hype so it was probably like hey 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 uh we want to do something just just sign on the dotted line how much money are we making for this yeah exactly Done. yeah i um, um actually in uh, an issue of my zine several years ago not several years maybe three or four years ago i published a list of every single B and bts endorsement i could find and it was mm -hmm. Well over 50. Oh, wow. This is before McDonald's even. So, yeah. <laughs> like, people kind of think, like, oh, yeah, K-pop is about, like, bands that really know how to dance and, <laughs> you know, have songs or whatever. But, like, that's just one of the things they do. Most of their energy is put towards raking in money like this. Because they're not making what? money from record sales as much as they are from body friend chairs that cure COVID-19 or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's the um one guy's doing now like he was on the um uh Sajin restaurant uh show recently. Mm. It's it's all about bringing in money, uh product placement, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh but you know, like I mean, it it's I always get a chuckle like uh what was the um the old Dead Kennedy song Pull My Strings um Mm -hmm. I, I won't I won't dare say the uh, the the uh, chorus to that song for my dear listeners, but uh, <laughs> you can Google that. Um, you know, but I, I think that it, it's sort of uh, kind of wrapping things up, like and going back to our original point about like punk in Korea and whatnot is mm -hmm. I think that's why uh, like the scenes in, in Hongdae and whatnot and even just the busking to to give a really sort of surface level i i think that's what makes it a little bit more special because it's it's sort of outside that mass produced meat grinder a little bit um yeah to be so honest maybe... a lot of the buskers there are uh part of the meat grinder <laughs> um, oh are they okay <laughs> oh, yeah. like a lot of the like a lot of dance studios like you know have like their students go there and do performances it's like you know it's a way to interact with an audience and build a fan base and a lot of those dancers mm -hmm. have fans but to me, I look at it and it's just kind of like this is occupying space that used to be, you know, not part of this. You know, like Hongdae used to be the place you'd go to get away from K-pop. And it yeah. certainly isn't anymore. <laughs> oh, Jesus. OK. Yeah. So well, uh, I, I have mixed feelings about the busker situation. And I don't know if it's recovered since the pandemic ended. I barely ever go to Hongdae anymore. I haven't been up there in, in decades. But yeah. All right. Well. As we get to the end, is there is there anything that you're doing or anything that you would like to uh, promote or give a shout out? Well, I am working uh, right now uh, on the next issue of the zine, which is number 32. Uh, as I mentioned, it's being released for that festival. It's a fest. If you want to look that up, you can just search WDIKrea.com. Uh, yeah, so I'm planning to do stuff for that. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I published uh, like... The zine also, I turned it into an actual publishing company. I have kind of books. Uh, oh, nice. And one of them, the most recent one, I totally forgot to put it online. And I still haven't put it online. It's been almost a year now. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I've 
forgotten to try to sell it online. I, I got to do that, you know. Uh, so, yeah, if you want, uh, look up Broke Publishing. And note that it's publish ng, not I. Just wanted to spell it wrong. Just, you know, see what would happen. <laughs> uh, you can find that on places like Facebook or my website. So, yeah. Uh, other than that, yeah, I'm also working on the next issue of Transactions, the Journal of the RAS. Uh, issue 96 or 7, 97, I think. Oh, wow. uh, after it started in 1900. Uh, so yeah, I'm doing a punk zine on one hand, and I'm also doing uh, the oldest Korean studies uh, journal in the world. Well, English language <laughs> Korean studies journal, anyway. <laughs> so yeah, and doing one has certainly informed how I do the other, I gotta say. You know, I, I, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> That that that's quite the contrast. You've got sort of highbrow and lowbrow at the same time. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I remember a couple of years ago, I uh, we had one issue where I, I wrote about. Uh, I looked at the history of Korean punk compilations, because mm -hmm. um, a lot of them have stories behind them that you know come out, and I tried to keep it pretty clean and everything like that. And one of the other articles was written by Brother Anthony, a mm -hmm. Tazy monk who's been here since 1980, and his was yeah. about. Uh, dissident poets and like so like he he was showing like you know the some of the poetry of like kim ji ha and people like that and it was like it was pretty crude it was it was like punk song lyrics and i was like <laughs> you know maybe history isn't so much highbrow when you do it right <laughs> exactly yeah in history perfect yeah <laughs> all right um and, and where can people find your stuff? Just uh, I'll probably put it in the show, show notes as well. But uh, if there's any places that you want to kind of direct people to. Uh, the single yeah. one place is dehanmindecline.com. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's probably the easiest place to direct people. My own like website. It has links to other websites that you would need to use. Uh, so, yeah, that's the place to look where you'll see my most recent work. I don't really care about putting stuff on Instagram. Or Facebook, yep. so yeah. <laughs> All right, Dehan Min Decline, perfect. And uh, yeah, I, I'll put a lot of these uh, links in the show notes. I'm, I'm not even sure people click on them, but uh, oh. listeners, if you are, click on these because there's some. There's a, it's a treasure trove of stuff. Like I've clicked through it, and definitely, uh, like I, I love sort of. Um, you know, we talked about the different places, but just the feel of it is yeah. is much more than the sort of the. Uh, pretty sunsets that i normally take so <laughs> <laughs> yeah it doesn't always give me the most attractive photos but it gives me photos nobody else has done uh i i haven't even updated it with the the latest adventures i've been on last weekend i had the opportunity to go to a barbecue on yongsan garrison and during that i was just able to freely slip away from the party and drive my scooter around the entire base and see this landscape that Civilians don't generally get to see. Uh, I, I've seen it all before, but this was the first time that I went there and it was empty. Was That's coming say, up. Yeah. Yeah. During May Day, which was on Monday, uh, two days ago, by our time. Yeah. Uh, yep. I uh, saw, tried to get inside subway tunnels that were under construction. Only succeeded in one. So, yeah. Okay. Too soon. <laughs> With the Yongsan Garrison, um, not to mm -hmm. get too ahead of myself, I'll let people oh, pick through those, but um, no, no. Um, no warning shots were fired or anything like that. So we're, uh, no, I nothing? barely saw anybody. Um, I'm I'm working on a few plans to minimize any fallout, like from posting the pictures online. I might actually wait a couple months or something before they go online. Uh, okay. I also might not refer to it by its name so that it'll be harder for you know the CIA or whoever to find. <laughs> I don't want to get Guantanamo. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get Guantanamo mode. Yeah, if, yeah. If, we, if we suddenly see you uh, disappear, then we'll know we'll know what happened. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll wrap things up here. John, thanks again for coming on. And uh, I'll try and piece everything together and uh, I'll let you know uh, how it all goes. But uh, thank you again for, for coming on. It, yep. It's been a great time. Yeah, good to talk to you uh, face to face again somewhat. Perfect. All right, we'll we'll put a pin in that now and we'll talk at you again later. Bye.